Welcome to the best of the day. We are in Chicago for the annual ASCO meeting. I am Ramaswamy Govindan, Professor of Medicine at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. With me today is Dr. Ann Sow, a well-known uh, expert in lung cancer. She's an Associate Professor of Medicine at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. Thank you so much. And today we have, uh, we have quite a few abstracts to cover, and yes. we'll start off with the early stage non-small cell lung cancer. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the early stage non-small cell lung cancer, particularly the ECOG adjuvant study? Yes, definitely. So ECOG 1505 was an adjuvant trial looking at investigators' choice of chemotherapy versus an arm where they included bevacizumab. Now we saw previously from prior publication, uh, prior abstracts that the E1505 study was not showing a survival benefit with the bevacizumab. Now what they're showing this time at ASCO is a comparison between the investigator arm choice of the different chemotherapy regimens to see if there was really a difference. And so of course cisplatin venerelbine was one of the arms and they also were looking at cisplatin taxanes with docetaxel primarily and also cisplatin pemetrexid and they broke it down by non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer and squamous cell. And the bottom line was that there really was absolutely no difference in survival outcome between all the different regimens. When they did a comparison statistically to the cisplatin venerelbin, which is theoretically the gold standard, really all of the combinations didn't look any different. I mean, maybe in the non-squamous cell carcinoma population, the cispem arm was a little bit trending, but it didn't reach statistical significance. So I guess the bottom line is, you can choose whatever chemo regimen works for your patients in the adjuvant setting. What do you do in practice? So I tend to like cisplatin pemetrexid a lot for our non-squamous, non-small cells. So I will give four cycles of cispem um, if they're an adenocarcinoma in particular. If, however, they're a squamous cell carcinoma patient, then I generally will do cisplatin docetaxel. And that's because I used to do head and neck and I have a comfort level with the regimen and I like it. Um, but you certainly can also do cisplatin gemcitabine with equivalent efficacy. Do you give growth factors when you use cis docetaxel? So sometimes I do. I follow the ASCO guidelines for that, so mm -hmm. I won't do it on the initial first cycle unless there's some pre-existing condition that makes me nervous mm -hmm. that this is somebody who needs it. Um, but in general, I do wait until the patient might have a grade 4 myelosuppressive event or febrile neutropenia, and then they get it for every cycle mm -hmm. thereafter. And there is an ongoing study that is looking at yes. the addition of targeted therapies that is called the Alchemist study. Yes, very uh, important that we support these trials because obviously while we're talking right now about the unselected mutated, uh, non-mutated patients and what the standard should be for them, we do know that the mutated population is, uh, they're different entities. Their biology is just completely different. Mm -hmm. So the EGFR mutated patients on the Alchemist study will be randomized to adjuvant chemotherapy versus adjuvant chemo mm -hmm. plus the targeted agent. And that's actually critical because maybe the addition of these targeted agents might prolong survival for them. And there's also the um, ALK mutated patients as well that have their arm with crizotinib. Uh, there is also going to be nivolumab uh, uh, added yes. on to that as well in the adjuvant study. Mm -hmm. Moving on to stage 3 non-small cell lung cancer, can you talk to us a little bit about this elderly population? Yeah, so I think that the, the several, or several abstracts that were presented during the poster discussion session and also in conglomerate from the oral session was kind of not really telling us anything new, that our elderly patients who are defined as over the age of 70 do appear to have a worse toxicity profile when they get combined modality of chemoradiation. Mm -hmm. um, and this is not anything too new. We know that there's some really good elderly patients and some true elderly that don't tolerate mm -hmm. treatment. But in the patients that are able to complete their treatment, their progression-free survival is equivalent to those who are younger. So what I think was really critical that came out of this um, ASCO was the advent of the VES-13 study, um, which is a geriatric evaluation that can predict who's going to be able to tolerate treatment better as opposed to those who are not. And I think that that use, I think it's the vulner vulnerable elderly scale, mm. I think that that will be very important to move forward in clinical studies so that we are treating aggressively those patients that can tolerate it because it doesn't serve any purpose to put a patient on a study when they can't finish the treatment. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. I think this is very important because the median age of lung cancer is around 69 to 70. So it is an important study. Uh, moving on to the advanced non-small cell lung cancer, uh, can you talk a little bit about this targeted therapies and what, what mm -hmm. new presentations So I think I think that there were two big categories that came out in the poster discussion session. The first was um, the RET mutated uh -huh. population of lung cancer. This is a real entity, albeit rare, maybe about 2% of the population. But we now have these agents that target RET. Cabozantinib in the past was presented in 2015. Um, and now there are vandantinib trials that were presented, mm -hmm. which actually do show modest response rates. Um, and I think larger studies are kind of needed to really determine the true median PFS and OS. But here's an example of a small population of patients that once we identify the, an oncogenic driver, we can mm -hmm. get them a drug that can be effective. And these drugs are approved for use in kidney oh, yes. cancer and, and thyroid cancer. So Absolutely. we hopefully we can get them. The challenge is how to do those studies mm -hmm. and because these are present in 1% of it's the population. Tough. It's tough. You know, we actually do advocate screening the adenocarcinoma population with genetic profiles. So you encompass that as part of your screening. And in that we have just not only EGFR mutation, the ALK, ROS1, um, but also BRAF mutation because there are drugs that target BRAF that are already in commercial use and also RET now. Right. Um, so I think that these are very important developments that you mm -hmm. can truly impact on a patient's quality of life mm -hmm. for a significant duration. Um, I did want to make a quick comment sure. though about another category that came out during the poster discussion session and that's with the KRAS mutant population. Mm -hmm that now we understand that there are now going to be subpopulations within KRAS mm -hmm. that have different prognostic levels. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to not just assume every KRAS mutation is the same. We now know that there are additional you know, co-secondary mutations that can impact responses mm -hmm. to treatment and also potentially impact prognosis. Mm -hmm. You know, this, even this genotype matters and there are specific subtypes may have different outcomes yes. as we know more and more about that. And easier for mutant lung cancer, mm -hmm. anything you want to comment on? Well, ozomertinib obviously was very important, uh -huh. um, which, you know, everybody knows is already FDA approved for the salvage setting for T790 mutant positive. Um, but what I think is exciting, and again, very preliminary, so not for commercial use or um, clinical practice yet, but there are several EGFR mutant-specific drugs that can cross the blood-brain barrier. Mm -hmm. And so that's such an important facet because oftentimes our EGFR mutant patients will fail in the brain. And so these new drugs that can cross the blood-brain barrier I think are very exciting mm -hmm. and very hopeful for our patients. Just like what you mentioned about the KRAS mutant lung cancer, I saw a few posters where uh, the outcomes in patients with EGFR mutant lung cancer varied quite a bit uh, mm -hmm. in, in, with regard to the presence or absence of P53 mutation. Yeah. And we have been looking at the genotype in EGFR, L858R versus exon 19, but also the concurrent presence of P53 mutation yeah. of certain types may mean something Absolutely. compared to others. These are early, very provocative data, mm -hmm. but I think we'll be looking at that in, in coming years. Yeah. And, um, uh, moving on to immunotherapy, there will be a, a session on immunotherapy. We'll be talking about that in the best of the day sessions. But can you tell us briefly about the frontline mm -hmm. uh, combination therapy with so, checkpoint inhibitors? So certainly, um, for a little bit of background, obviously, you know, pembrolizumab for PDL1 positive patients and nivolumab for unselected patients, all are FDA approved right now in the second line, third line setting. Mm -hmm. But you know, the big issue is trying to move these drugs into frontline. And so there's been a lot of excitement about doing these immunotherapies in combination with chemo, or even in the PDL1 positive population, doing it in replacement of combined modality, um, sorry, combined chemotherapies. And so these are trials that are ongoing, um, but one that's garnered a ton of excitement has been the combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab. Um, specifically, not necessarily in non-small cell, because they had more modest response rates in that study, albeit a synergistic effect, but really in the small cell um, refractory population. Mm -hmm. In those patients, the combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab actually doubled response rates compared to nivolumab alone. And so there's a lot of excitement that finally in a disease 
that we've had such little progress over the mm -hmm. last 10 years um, that we can actually see some beginning benefit um, mm -hmm. in patients who have progressed after chemo. So that's a good segue to talk about small cell lung cancer. So today at the oral session, Charlie Rudin presented the data on the antibody drug conjugate against dl 3 I was involved in that study as well, but I'd like to get to uh, mm -hmm. know what you think about mm -hmm. that. Presentation. Well, I'm very excited because you've got a target, the DLL3, and you mm -hmm. can, it's a biomarker. It, it can be predictive of a response. I believe the response rate with the stem centrics drug was close to 60%, correct, with the high DLL3 positive patients. And so having the target makes all the difference for these patients. And so I think it's a very exciting study. Um, I think it, it was great to be presented in the oral session, even though it's a still very early on. And I believe that the phase three study will hopefully give us some definitive data. Um, and it's now AbbVie, AbbVie right? Correct. Um, so hopefully, you know, we'll see a drug finally FDA approved in the salvage setting beyond mm -hmm. Topatican for small cell. You know, just so, uh, I would add a few more things. This drug is reasonably well tolerated. There is some serocell edema, serocell effusions that can be a problem, and peripheral edema. There's also some uh, skin reactions, especially mm -hmm. in the sun exposed areas. But I've treated quite a few patients in this drug, with this drug, and it's actually reasonably well tolerated. Um, small cell lung cancer is a disease where we have not seen much of a progress over the last 30 years. So any progress here is, is useful. And the fact that we have now some options, including uh, combination immunotherapy in this and the DL3 antibody drug conjugate, gives us some hope that we'll make some progress finally. I, I just saw the poster presentation uh, with uh, Viliparib, uh, which is a PARP inhibitor uh, with temozolomide uh, mm -hmm. yesterday, and uh, in fact we were part of the study as well, and it, it really showed increased response rates over temozolomide alone, but the issue is it didn't really make a big difference in overall survival. It's a small a multicenter randomized, uh, non-randomized phase two study. Uh, but, but again, showing that uh, there is an urgent need to mm -hmm. really go after, mm -hmm. uh, you know, novel approaches, uh, use novel approaches to go after resistant small cell lung cancer. So that's where I really think the DL3 antibody drug conjugate has promise. Sure, it doesn't work for everybody. Even in DL3 positive patients, uh, it, it works in about somewhere between 49 to 50 percent of the patients. So really, we need to actually find ways to mm -hmm. understand how best to utilize the drug. But definitely, there's a glimmer of hope there. Yes, definitely. And do you want to comment anything about mesothelioma? Right. So there were two studies that were presented today. Um, the first was the determined trial, um, which I was a part of. Um, and this, unfortunately, was looking at tremolumumab, a CTLA-4 inhibitor, compared to placebo. And unfortunately, it was a negative trial. Um, you know, I think that the CTLA-4 inhibitors, the path forward for development in mesothelium is going to be in combinations. Sure. Um, and so there are a few studies throughout the world that are looking at the combination of CTLA-4 inhibitors plus PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors, just like what mm -hmm. we did, uh, what we're seeing in small cell and in non-small cell. The second study was looking at a Pfizer agent, Avalumab, and this was the largest study presented to date of 50 patients, and it was actually a subset analysis of the mesothelioma cohort from the Javelin trial. Mm -hmm. And um, in this study, they basically showed a modest response rate of only 9.4%. Um, but with that said, out of the 50-ish patients, they did have a very high disease control rate. Mm -hmm. Now, the question with that study is that if you actually looked at their patient um, that enrolled to the trial, their median time to enrollment was 1.8 years. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't usually see a lot of patients that have that long mm. in the salvage setting. And they had quite a high percentage of patients who had been treated with three prior lines, four prior lines mm -hmm. of therapy. So that already is a very unique population of patients. Mm -hmm. And so what I do think that this does show, um, albeit a very small subgroup of patients, 50 patients, is that the PDL1 positive IHC patients didn't appear to have any predictive value here because the responders half, you know, had the PDL1 expression, the other half did not. So it shows that we really do need a better biomarker. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that this is an issue across all the solid tumors. Mm -hmm. And so this just falls in line with the rest of the other tumor types that we need to figure out better, whether it's mm -hmm. tumor load, tumor genetic burden, mm -hmm. um, whether it's something in the plasma. 
um, some sort of immune profile. These are all things that we need to work out better to determine who, who is going to get the best benefit from these drugs. Because when they do, they do have significant duration of response. Mm -hmm. And that is incredibly beneficial for those patients. Mm -hmm. In the last couple of minutes, I want to summarize what we have been discussing. So feel free to add or modify what I'm saying. Uh, some key take-home points. Number one, in the early stage non-small cell lung cancer, the ECOG study, while it showed that additional bevacizumab did not improve the outcomes, it also gives some clarity on what chemotherapy agents themselves did, and in terms of, uh, you know, tolerability and efficacy, it sounds like it's very similar to the old Joan Schiller, um, the earlier Joan Schiller study. Uh, that showed that there was no big difference between yeah. the agents. So that still holds it, true even in the adjuvant setting. Yeah, so it to just speak. comes down to toxicities and maybe cost. Individual thing if and that's cost, an issue. of course, of yeah. course. In stage three non-small cell lung cancer, you know, we got to pay attention to the elderly how we select patients. And uh, in stage four non-small cell lung cancer, we're making progress in the red positive lung cancer, EGF from mutant lung cancer. We are now teasing out subgroups that are going to be, you know treated one way or the other, similar, the same way, KRAS mutant lung cancer, and, uh, you know, different subsets that may do differently. Strikingly, in small cell lung cancer, there are two areas that actually are possibly paths to progress. One is the combination immunotherapy checkpoint inhibitors, and then the antibody drug conjugate against DLL3. Mm -hmm. And hopefully in the coming years, we'll be doing more intelligent and thoughtful studies with immunotherapy, biomarkers, and hopefully we'll move the field forward. Well, thank you so much for being here to summarize uh, the developments in lung cancer world and for the best thank of the so day much. for our audience. Thank you so much, Dr. Sao. Thank you for joining Best of the Day for Lung Cancer.